All right, okay, let's get started. Okay, so first of all, the uh, homework is out. Sorry for being a little bit late. So we'll be due next Monday at midnight instead of, instead of this Friday. Okay, so shift everything over by three days. Okay, so that's the uh, that's homework seven. And then, so today we'll continue on with probability, then we'll go into solar and storage. Okay, so all the problem, whatever we've been saying for probability, of course, equally applies to solar instead of wind. Right, we're just using wind as examples, but uh, everything applies equally. Okay. So last time we started talking about continuous distributions, right? Distributions where the values are real numbers. They can take on a real number instead of just a discrete set of values. The last time, for example, we saw things like Gaussian. Right, so this is no, this is written as zero mu sigma squared. This is mean. This is the variance. Okay, so this is, a, for example, a very standard continuous distribution or continuous random variable. Okay. So again, the benefit of using this continuous distribution is that one allows you to do things like integrals. Very sometimes easy to do. Second allows you to summarize this, this thing using two numbers. All right, so when we have a discrete distribution, you just get this big table of things. So it's not easy to think about summary. So here it allows you to summarize using, for example, just two parameters. So Gaussian is one of the standard ones. Again, the benefit of Gaussian is when you add things, things stay Gaussian, okay, which is very rare. In random variable. Okay, so this is a good distribution to use. Last time, so looking at Gaussian. Of course, in reality, right, so of course, in reality, nothing is Gaussian because the, the issue with Gaussian distributions this allows anything to happen. Okay, so what this does, uh, this allows anything to happen. If you look at the PDF, right, so let's say this is the mean mu. And then there's something like this, right? It's a bell-shaped PDF like this. So it is, you know, as, as you go further and further away from the mean, it is more and more likely that, so it's less and less likely for this value to happen, but the likelihood is not zero. Okay, so this is never zero. The probability of any interval happening is never zero. So for example, if you wait long enough, anything can happen. Okay, well, I know if anything can happen. So in practice, especially with things like power generation, of course, not anything to happen. Right? So it's just not possible. So in power, what typically happens is we want to model things like a lower bell and upper bell for, for a distribution. Right? We want to model things like, you know, your turbine has a maximum power output, let's say of 10 megawatts or you have a minimum power output of say zero. Right? We want to model this kind of thing. But we still want to use something like Gaussian because it's easy to describe. Okay, so very often we use uh, something like, uh, so wind power, so truncated Gaussian. In fact, what does truncated Gaussian mean is you basically truncate the two tails off. Okay, anything you take a maximum, anything more than the max gets folded back onto the max. Anything less than the mean gets folded to the mean. So for example, when power, P, so let's, this is normally written as something of, you take a max, Okay, so what we want to do is we want to take some, say, uh, let's say, let's say W. This is sort of the non truncated Gaussian. Zero and P max. Okay, so this is typically what happens if you do in practice. And you feed some random variable into this. And you say, well, I generate power. Well, my minimum is zero. My maximum is P max. 
Okay, so let's just truncate off control of these. So what this means, what this means is the following. This is Okay, so this is just a way of thinking about a, let's say, a power coming out of some sort of more standard distribution. Okay, so you just take something that can go to infinity, so it can go very wide range on both sides, just truncate it. You just say anything above P max, I'm going to hold at P max. Anything below, I'm, you know, P mean or zero, I'm going to hold at zero. And then we have, you know, in the middle, I can have p equals to the untruncated random variable. Right. So then this sort of the if you look at the PDF or the PD, the PDF of this looks interesting. Okay. So let's so let me not draw the y-axis. So let's just say okay, so this is the PDF. Then in the middle. Let's say it looks something like this, right? This is the untruncated part. This is the middle part. Then when you truncate like this, what happens to a probability? Let's say this one. What happens when you put many values, right? So W, if this W can take on many values, you set it to the same value. What does it take, right? So this looks like a delta function. And so what happens in this is this is a delta function because there's non-zero mass on the probability. And so this single value has a non-zero probability of happening, so we have a delta function. So here you have a delta function, p max, let's say zero, you have a delta function. So this is commonly what the distribution will look, look like in practice. As you always have alpha lower limit for threshold. Okay, all the devices we have have some limits, have some ratings. So you can saturate your rating. This happens for solar, for wind, especially for storage, you'll see this a lot. Okay, there'll be limits, we'll hit this limit, and we'll create a sort of this delta function. Okay, so, okay. so we won't do analysis on this again, because when you do integrals, they have a delta function, this actually becomes quite uh, a little bit tricky. You have to be very careful when you start computing things. We have delta functions of that. Okay, so we won't, you know, we won't turn this into a calculus class and compute things, but just something to remember, okay? And so in this week's homework, one of the questions it will be, you'll be download a bunch of data, just ask you as to the mean and variance and do histogram plot. You basically, you'll see something like this, right? That's on purpose, okay? So you did not make a mistake if you have a lot of concentration on both ends. That's trying to show what this comes from. And you can ask the mean and variance the exactly the same way as before, okay? Just empirically, you know, ask the mean and variance, the plot histogram, you'll see something like this. And for that, pro for that problem, when you plot the histogram, it's up to you to choose the width of the bin such, things make, such that things make sense. Okay, so you have to really look to that histogram that uh, you know, makes some sense, that can be communicated to people. Okay, so in that, I think that's homework question two. So that's left up to you to choose how wide you want to be. You have to choose them wide enough to capture several data points, but not too wide that you don't get a shape. Okay, so that's one thing you'll do a lot if you work in industry, you'll be drawing those kind of things. Okay, so that's sort of replicate that, right? Any questions about this truncated? Okay, yeah, good. Of course, yes. It will be different, yes. Because you have many values hitting. That's it. Yeah, so the variance will be different. We're not going to do that computer. You can do it. But that turns out to be tricky. So the variance of a truncated Gaussian, there is a formula, but it's very long formula. There's a sort of long formula for variance and becomes or not quite interesting. And the Gaussian also has another challenge as even though the distribution is nice, So a challenge with, well, not so much, a ch you know, it's really a big challenge, but one thing with Gaussian is, so let's say I have something that's sort of Gaussian. The PDF is very easy to write down, one over root two, 
pi sigma e to the minus, let's say alpha w minus mu squared two sigma squared. So the PDF is very easy to write. It. This is your exponential something squared PDF. The one of the challenge that we have is to compute probability like this. Okay, so let's say. So one, you know, one challenge we have is I often want to compute this, want to compute the probability of this value take coming into. This again happens a lot in, and this is where you want to find the fraction of time that your turbine is up. You have this kind of, so let me be more specific and uh, write this. Okay, so this is a very, very common probability calculation we do. And so technically, or by definition, it is this distribution, it is this integral. Okay, so you integrate, right, the density from the minimum to the maximum of the, of the density function, and you get the probability. The challenge with Gaussian is that you don't have a closed form for this. We, just, we don't have a closed form equation for this. And this is used so often that people have named a function after it. Okay, so if you work in something like communica in communications, people basically give this function a name. And there you use it a lot that you feel like this is even, this is a closed form function. So you can use this often enough, you feel it's a closed form function. Although in power context, uh, it would be good to have a closed form equation for this, right? Because you want to ask a question like, you know, if I change my mean by this much, how does this probability change? If I change my variance by this much, how does my probability change? Right, if I put a storage that reduce variance by half, yeah, how does the probability change? All of those will be useful if we have a closed form solution, have some equation I can look at. Unfortunately, for Gaussian, we don't. Okay, this thing integrated is not something nice. Okay, so this is, so although computationally, all your computers, you know, even your cell phone will store a table with this value function. This is actually something that's stored by almost all electronic devices. They will look up this, you can have a lookup table and that's well, very well programmed. But the challenge is that with, there's no closed form solution. There is not a closed form solution. So we, invent, so there are some other distribution you can use, whereas there are sort of better looking closed form solutions. Okay, so one, you know, I guess one reason people start looking at something other than Gaussian is, you know, Gaussian, there's modeling prob problems, so it has negative values, so it's an infinite thread, all that. And uh, also there's no closed form. Okay, so it would be nicer if I had a closed form, you know, Oh, we can look at some other distributions where there is a close one for this kind of probability distribution. Okay. So the CDF always has a close one. Well, I want this also to have a close one. So some other, okay. so this must start to matter less since computers are so heavily used but still be good to develop some intuition. And again, just depend on different fields. Again, if you work in wireless communications, they'll tell you this is a closed form function. Okay, they work so much with this function. They'll say this is closed form. Like for them, this is the function to understand. For us, we don't have, you know, there's not that well developed in our field, but we tend to look at some of the other distribution. Okay, so this is what we talk about. This is our sort of, uh, really, or chi square, this or chi, you can call this chi square distribution function. Again, now this is trying to say, hey, if I want to model one speed, instead of truncating things, we have a Gaussian, when power is truncating things, let me just have something that says defined only for positive values. Okay, so here, when I define it, only for positive values, right? So here, W has to take a positive number and then you evaluate this equation. 
So this obviously has to be taken positive. And the reason this looks nice is because, because now I can compute things like uh, probability of you like. Because I have this W downstairs, so then I can do integration by parts. Okay, so the reason this particular form is used is that this allows you to do integration by parts. And I think for this is chosen because you can do it. Okay, so what this does is makes all these calculations easy. So for example, if you ask for things like probability, let's say you're you know above some value, let's say we want you to do this. The way you would do it is you would do this through an integration by parts. Right? So W, e to the something W squared can be integrated. Okay, this is something we can integrate. So we're not going to do this integral here, but the reason why this has a closed form is because this thing here. Okay, so that's why we can't do a closed form integral. And this will turn out to be, if you do the integration, minus power four, Average square. Okay, so this is a particularly nice function. It's pretty nice uh, looking probability. Okay, and so and to track this probability makes sense. Okay, so the way to track this kind of probability makes sense is you take this W A to its extreme values. Okay. So what should happen when I'm putting W A equal to zero? What is the probability? Of a positive random variable greater equal to zero, what, right? I got this probability what? So putting zero, e to the zero is one. So this is a sandy check. What happens when I'm putting infinity for the probability? Probably should be zero, right? Probability of something greater than infinity should be zero. I'm putting infinity here, this is negative infinity square, so this is there. Okay, so this thing makes sense. Let's say probability that makes sense. It's easy to evaluate. You can directly look at given the average. What is the probability of above and below? Okay. Oh, so you take a bunch of measurements and you do the sample average. Right? So you sort of have to believe this is a distribution. Right? So that's something, that's a modeling choice you make. Right? So you believe I'm characterized by this thing, and then you take an average and you can compute it. Right? So that's a belief. That's a modeling choice, actually. The better word is modeling choice. The like we choose things to be Gaussian. So you can choose it to, you can believe it's Gaussian and compute the mean and the variance and use that PDF to do calculation. You can believe it's in this distribution. So the interesting calculation will be. Then what about this? How do I compute this? So if I know this one side of probability, so this number, then what about this thing? Just using this number, can I compute this? Probably in the interval? Right, so you can subtract here. What, what does this say? This is I'm larger than WA, smaller than WB. So you can you equally write this probability as two things, right? So I want to, this is the probability. I'm larger than WA, but then I'm over counting, right? I'm counting the, the cases where I'm also larger than WB. So you subtract off right, the things you over counted, right? So you only focus in this interval. So two things have to happen. You have to be larger than WA. If something cannot happen, you cannot be larger than WB. So you just subtract this thing off. Okay? So that's why if you can calculate this sort of one-sided probability, then this becomes pretty easy.
become this kind of thing. So you have this kind of probability, uh, two times probability. Again, if you if you use estimate this average and you believe this is a true distribution, then you get this value. Okay. Any questions? So the probability calculation. Okay, so you do so. For example, the variance can also be computed. So you do this quite often. You do see this sort of quite often. There's a very advantage. Uh, in practice, because it's kind of close to our formula. Okay, so you do see this. And so there's, when you look at papers, for example, you see this kind of things uh, all the time. Because again, I can, if I change the average, I directly have control of the variance and I directly have control of this intro. Okay. So that's, that's something we use in practice especially in a lot of papers that wants to do this integral, right, that has a goal of doing something else that wants to do this integral, this happens quite a bit. All right, so this is the uh, Rayleigh distribution. So it has several advantages, the most sort of the biggest thing about it, this is, or two things, this is, on the positive numbers, which is not nothing, right? This is uh, quite useful for it to be on positive numbers. And has easy formulas. If that has for easy formulas, we can use. And it's entirely defined on positive numbers. Right, so this is the really distribution. Of course, this still has some drawbacks is that, so the drawbacks of this is you do not get to control mean and the variance separately. So that's a drawback of, of this distribution. Gaussian is nice because you got to control mean and variance separately. This is not so nice because my variance is completely determined by the mean. Okay, so I may want to control both separately. For example, if I take a lot of data, I can empirically estimate the mean and I can empirically estimate the variance and they don't match by this formula, right, then this is not a very good distribution. Okay. No, because given a bunch of data, I can ask me, estimate the mean and the variance separately. I have one equation for estimating the mean, one equation for estimating the variance. If this distribution was a true distribution, they have to be related by this equation. Right? And they may not be. Okay, so this talk talk about the control of the distribution, right? So simple, I can do the integral. It's too simple. It's sort of I don't have enough degree of freedom to fit my data. Okay, so if my data doesn't turn out to be the same well, the way I want it to turn out, then you're not in a very good place. Okay, so that's a main drawback of this distribution. All right, so we could control mean and variance. Definitely, I could do this. But again, the nice thing is, you know, let's, uh, we can do some calculations now, if it's really, because the equations are nice. Okay, it will be harder for Gaussian. But let's, uh, let's do this, right? So we're going to assume a really statistic your any energy produced by having a turbine like this. Okay? So I have 700 kilowatts, wind turbine, this power. I have average wind power speed at five meters per second. I have some efficiency, I have some, some friction coefficient. So this is the alpha number we have. Let me compute the annual energy. So basically, this tells you the mean of distribution. It tells you the mean. Based on this mean, we have to do all this calculation. Okay, and the equation again turns out to be nice. Okay? So this is alpha is 0.2. This is the mean. Okay, so we measure the mean. We believe this is the right statistics to use. And let's see if we can compute it. All right, so. Okay, 
so the first thing to do is we want the tower is at 50 meters and measure wind speed at 10 meters. Okay, so first of all, let's compute the tower speed. Let's compute the speed at the tower height. Okay, so wait for a second. Then at 50 meters, right? so what happens at 50 meters? We have So this is a equation we have seen in the first part of the class. Fifty over ten point two. So this is a fifty six point nine meters per second. So the W average we use. It's 6.9 meters per second. So this is so this is the example of how we can relate different parts of the class. Okay, so you can still have to know this equation existed. Okay, so you cannot forget this, you know, when you cannot pretend that you've never seen the sequence, but it will not be very central. But still you show up like this. And this is a good practical, right? It's much easier to measure things at 10 meters per second, uh, at 10 meters than 50 meters. Okay, so this is still used quite often. And then your distribution is something like, so we're just going to plug things in. 6.9 squared e to the minus pi over 4. Okay, so this is our distribution. And then what we want to compute is we want to compute the average, right? We want to compute the power, we want to compute the average power that is consumed. Okay. So the power we have is F delta A cube of the speed, right? So uh, this is speed cubed. Okay. So this is the cube of the speed. So when we look at the average power, right, so what we want to do is the energy is integral of power over T. All right, so we want to figure out basically how much energy. So this is compute any energy consumed. So you compute the power. You look at uh, how long each year is, and then sum the energy. So this will give you some summation of the energy. Okay. Yeah. Right. So what this gives you is just the average because we're not assuming anything that's different from hour to hour in the year. So this will be just the average power. Right. You take look at this power. What is the average? have it over a year, this will be the energy you can produce. Okay. Right, so all this comes from the, so why this integral just say average multiplied by number of hours? Again, we're not assuming there's any relationship between different hours. Okay, so every hour is the same. Right, so just average multiplied by hours. Okay, so if this dependent on time, you cannot do this. But this does not depend on time, so we can do this. So the average power, what is the average power? Well, this is integrating from there to infinity half delta A. This is your power equation okay. multiplied by the density, right? multiplied by the density equation. Okay, so this is our integral that we can do. So what does this mean? This is the amount of power I can generate at a particular W. This is the chance, this is the density, this is the sort of the chance of that W happening. And then I integrate from there to infinity. Okay. Any questions about this? So I'm not expecting you to integrate this, but to just write down this integral. Okay. Right. So 
this integral always exists because even here you have a w to the four, this e to the minus w square will eventually dominate a large enough w. Okay, so this, once you have this kind of function here, this thing will exist. This is a question of can, you know, can we integrate this? Any questions about this? Yeah. And this you can actually do by hand. There is formula for this because you just do by parts. Okay, this is a polynomial w to the four times e to the w square. Just count all the constants. Let's go ahead and keep doing this integration by parts. You'll use that. eventually get a function that you can write down. Okay, so this is doable. We're not going to do this here. So this takes uh, takes about ten minutes to do this integration by hand. So normally, when you see this kind of equation, you have time to do it by hand. If you don't have time, just do this right here. Okay, well, you do this. Okay, so how we evaluate this integral is this computer, I think. If you do not have something, if you do not have access to like the symbolic integration. Okay, so let's say you see a question on the homework or on the final saying, you know, get to this equation and use computers to get a number out here. How we get a number? Any ideas? So some packages will allow you to do numerical integration. Right? So a lot of packages will just, you can type this in and it will do this integration for you. But for this kind of integration, it's not very hard to do, even if you don't have access to those kind of packages. So how will you numerically approximate this? Right, so you don't even need to travel very long. This, this kind of integrals are pretty well behaved. What you do is you digitize your space small enough, just evaluate the function at all those different spaces, you add them up, or you just add all the values up, and then multiply by how small your step size is. Okay. All right, so that's, that's the idea how you would integrate this. Right. So under this package, if you don't have access to a package, what you do is, now you can, so here after many steps, there is a closed form solution. Okay. Again, I'm not sort of, this kind of thing just comes out places. Right. So yeah, so it just comes out this way. So there's, there's this, is, this is a solution integrate. If you do not want to integration by parts, and get to the solution, what you can do is numerically, you can sort of discretize the space. By sort of dw, right? discretize this sort of by small steps dw, evaluate the function and add. So this is just, you can truncate it and add. For this kind of integrals, you'll get pretty close to this close form solution. It doesn't have to be very small. You don't have to look at many values. Okay, so that's one way to do it. Here, just because things are nice, it's not very hard to get to this final solution. So if you look at the P out, that's a CP times, so if you have time CP here, we got 0.3 times all those equations. We got 170 kilowatts. Energy, zero. This is 1.5 gigawatt hour. So this is for a turbine. This is, so again, is this a big turbine or small turbine? So you ask before I like, taking all this power class, you should take a look. If I tell you energy over a year is 1.5 gigawatt hour, it's big, small. Sorry? No, this is a tiny turbine. 
Okay, so this is a lot of times when you see things, especially in popular press, they'll give you this number. They say, wow, this you know, some gigawatt in front of it. Will this power our campus? No. This probably powers this building. That's sort of how large this is. <laughs> Again, each person on average consumes a kilowatt of power. That's just each person. So each one of us gets, you know, this is, we we got so close to 10 megawatt hour of power consumption for each person. Okay, so consuming one something gigawatt hour or producing one something gigawatt hour over a year is not a huge number. Okay. So this is the building size. That's what we think about. Okay, so again, it's good to have this sort of number in mind. Okay, so think of, you know, 10 megawatt as a average consumption by a person, a gigawatt hour a year as a mid-sized building, all those kind of things. They build that, okay, this kind of, okay. Okay, so that's something to know for this number. Again, the good thing is for this kind of wind calculation, this, what this problem I'm trying to show is, it's pretty easy to do this calculation because all you need to do is measure the average. Okay, stick a sensor at 10 meters high for a little bit. We can do this estimation. We can do all this estimation. All right, and we got a closed word formula again, which is quite nice. Scales directly with the average speed, which does not need to happen. They just weigh the same curve. All right, so there's one more distribution that people like. This is called a wave distribution. What this does is this generalizes the other distribution. This is defined for positive numbers, but give you two parameters to play around. Okay, so last one for the Rayleigh, the complaint was there's only one parameter. Here, so I need two parameters to play around. That's, all, that's how all these things go. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so this was, so before data science was very popular, there's a constant war of which one was better for what. Nowadays, you just collect data and shove it. So we don't bother with this anymore. But for about five, six years, this was a, you, know, you go to conferences, there's two groups of people. And you know, depending on who you are, which one you believe. So they sort of you know, ask you which one of these do you believe. Anyways, that's another common distribution, you'll see. And a lot of calculation is based on this distribution. So if you look some report, for example, looking ahead, you know, what will happen in 20 years for when, how much power can we generate? A lot of time will based on this assumption. They sort of assume this is the right distribution. They will fit in some parameters and do all these integrals. Okay, so that's where so this useful distribution to know. And that's two parameters. One is called a scale parameter, one is called a shape parameter. And we won't tell them where these names come from. But there's just two parameters. They're not mean and variance. So again, Gaussian is nice because the parameter for Gaussian makes sense. There's mean and variance. Here, there's you know, some main parameters. So it makes sense for shape and scale because what happens is this is quite flexible. It allows you to have different peaks. So one example is you can have small k. We'll sort of see this for sort of monotonic decay. Then they have large K. This will look, they will give you a peak. Okay, so it's quite flexible. This sort of nonlinear form make it quite flexible. Depending on what K you plug into it, you can either model a decay or a peak. Okay, so this, this is where the flexibility of the distribution come from. So it's quite a nice distribution. Uh, okay, this slide didn't make it, so. Okay, so the scale parameter does something similar. The scale parameter tells you how far the spread is for this. So you have a small C, what happens is this is, we'll have a narrow spread. You have a large C, this will happen as you have a large spread. So instead of directly controlling mean and variance, sort of controls what 
this sort of shape looks like. Okay, so this two parameters will control the shape. And again, this is nice. This allows you to model something that's, for example, quite concentrated. Let's say you have a wind power that's very concentrated, or you can have something that is very spread out. This one distribution with two parameters will give you this. And you cannot do this with real, for sure. Even for Gaussian, you cannot sort of do really do this. Okay, so this is, variable is nice. The form is complicated, but uh, it's quite nice to do. All right, so the challenge, so, okay, so again, let's see, make it, sorry about this, I'll go fix the graphs. There should be some graphs here, okay. But the, the challenge with this distribution is the average turns out not to be so easy to compute. Okay, so the average is not quite easy to compute. So if you look at this, so the average, this is integral from zero to infinity, w. This is not something that uh, we can compute directly, but there is a function that if you define w to be w over x to be w over c to the k, if you make this definition, then the average is some constant times x k to the one e to the minus x dx. And there's a name for this called the gamma function. Okay, so there's a name to this thing. This is called a gamma function, right? And uh, we are sort of this again as a standard function with tables you can look at. Okay, so this again, you know, if you never heard of gamma function, don't worry about it. Just that we can compute this average. You don't do this interval directly. What you do is you look at the table for gamma function. This was all tabulated for us. So if you're alive in the, let's say 1700s, one of the jobs for mathematicians was to make this kind of table. Well, your job is just to do this integral and put all the values there, right? So for example, Gauss was doing this, but they had you know, tables with thousands, hundreds and thousands of entries. Right? So nowadays, again, this is all digital, but you can look up this, this average. And the cumulative distribution uh, becomes nice. Even though the average is hard to compute, these probabilities are nice. The probability are nice functions you can compute. So we can repeat some of the same calculation as before. Okay, you can repeat some of the same calculation as before. Okay. Because that's the Rayleigh part. So the Rayleigh has a very nice average. The average shows up directly in the distribution. Here it doesn't, but still the, all those intervals become nice looking into those that we can compute. Okay. So for example, this is typically, you know, a way, way how we use it, right? So we can ask, what is the, we have a variable distribution of one speed of given site with all these parameters. So we somehow estimate these parameters. We believe the distribution is variable. Compute the number of hours per year where one speed is four meters per second or greater. And this is evaluating when the wind speed is large enough, what fraction of time during the year the wind speed is large enough. So we want to compute this probability. This is e to the minus four over c to the k, e to the minus four over five to the 1.2. So the probability of being larger than four is about 0.485, and then the number of hours per year, this will be, take the probability multiplied by the number of hours we have. Per year, okay, this is the, what we have. All right, any questions about this? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, zero, this is zero. zero. Yeah, you will never have to do this in you won't, you won't be asked to do this in zero. This is just a, if you took analysis, you may have seen gamma function before. It's quite a common function. Anyways, 
all we mostly need will be asked to do this question. Okay, so you'll see, for example, you know, a homework or getting on the final, you could see a question like this. And you could see a question like this. Perhaps more complicated, but still you need to use those two formulas. Okay, so those are correct. Yeah, Kate, Kate does not. Kate doesn't have it. Kate does not have it. Kate does not have it. There's something to this phone. Kate is a parameter. Like this place is square in Gaussian. So you want to think about Gaussian as something e to the something square. This is generalizing that tree. If you want. That does not have it yet. C has it. Kate does not. That's correct. Okay, all right, so okay, so there is so we cover three distributions. Again, wave was good thing to know because you do see so this a lot in practice. You will see this quite a bit. And we'll see this kind of calculation. Okay. Then so we'll take a break. So what we'll do is we'll look at things called correlation. Because all of this is within one one turbine. Right? One wind turbine distribute that way. What happens when we have multiple wind turbines? So what happens when we have two, we have three? How do we think about distribution in that way? That is a much more complicated subject, so we'll just sort of scratch the surface. So we'll stop here, and then let's take a 10 minute break. We'll come back at the uh, 9.20. We'll do the multiple search. <clears throat> all right, okay, so, all right, so it's just a comparison of the distribution we have seen. So again, variable is the most accurate because for those two parameters, you can fit a lot of things. You can pretty much fit through any things you see with variable plus the truncating of the distribution. This will cover most of it. Normal, again, makes a lot of assumptions, the easiest to use. Although this depends, <coughs> depend, right? So for example, we saw that, uh, so this may not be entirely true because normal, or Gaussian is good for error distribution. Okay, so it may not be a perfect distribution for speed or power, but if you make an estimate, then the error distribution is typically close to a norm, at least. Okay. But anyways, all of these today are not very challenging. Again, if you have data, if you have enough data to estimate the parameters, you probably we can directly work with the data. These are, you know, most useless because you want a closed form solution. But the problem where these will give you closed form solution, even using a very simple distribution, will give you a closed form solution, is very few. Okay, so today you might just well directly work with data. Okay, so today the way we deal with you know, whatever we want to do, we directly work with data. For a single turbine, right? So I have a single turbine, you just take measurement data and just deal with those data. You, the interesting thing and the challenge is that if you have multiple turbines, this is much, much more challenging to deal with. Okay, or this is site. If I have multiple sites, what to do? This is much more challenging. Okay, this is much more challenging, and all of these sort of except Gaussian, I guess, goes all the way. This is sort of the only thing we can potentially do using closed form solutions is for Gaussian, but even there, it's not very good. Okay, and it's just because the Reason is when you talk about multiple things, things become a lot more complicated. Things are a lot more complicated. The third dimension goes up. We want to talk about correlation and we want to talk about the uh, random variable, right? So the way correlation works is let's assume you have two sites or two turbines. X and y okay, for generic turbines and you can so you can take sort of w 
Ox can take. On let's say m values. Okay, so wx1, wx2, wx all the way to f. So I have one site where I can take on m values. These are the discrete values I measure, for example. And then I go to the other turbine, I can say, well, I can take on k values. Okay, they don't have to be the same, right? Okay, they can take on k values. Okay, so now the pro now the issue is, how do you talk about probability? How do you talk about probability? Is it enough to just assign a probability for these values? Is it not, right? So is it enough just to assign individual probabilities for this value? Right, so that's not enough because what we want to do is you want to say, what is the chance of, for example, this pair of values? Or what is the chance of, let's say, these two values pairs of values? Right? So instead of assigning probability to a single number, now we need to assign probability to pairs of numbers. Right, that's where probability makes sense. Because I want to say, what is the chance of, an event which depends on both sides happening. That's my probability. Okay. So the probability becomes we need to assign a probability to each pair. Okay. So I need to assign this probability. So I can assign probably PMK to the value of WXM, WYK. Okay, so this is how I can assign values. I take a pair and assign some probability to the pair. And now this probability has to make sense because my sum over all of the probabilities they have to sum over to one. Okay, so this is the way of just defining this probability. Right, so instead of a table where you have values and probability, now you have a bigger table with pairs of values, each one gets a sum probability. Okay. Any question? Good, yeah. Right, so this definitely do not consider a turbine to be independent. Right? Yeah. This is a joint number. For example, physically, maybe when x is small, y cannot be very large. Right, so they will be dependent. Right, so this is hard because we don't assume them to be independent. Right? So for again, for a pair of values, you get a number, you get a probability. For example, some some sort of combination may never happen. Right, so if y is downstream of x, then y is very unlikely to be larger than x. For example, there's some probability that never happened. Okay. So these are this does take into account of all things that can happen. So the challenge with this kind of modeling is uh, this blows up on you very, very quickly. Right? So we have two, you have to look at pairs. You have three, you have to look at you know. Three of them, in general, a farm may have 20 turbines. When you have a gigantic table, you cannot actually record. And for those cases, you cannot even record the values. So normally when we talk about this kind of probability is here we really do not want to look at this, this distribution in this entirety. This table is too big to make sense of. There are too many values to record. So what we end up is what we want is we want to get an intuitive feeling of something called a correlation. And like you said, are they independent? Does X not care what Y is? Or are there some relationship between the two values? Is one likely to be big when the other is big? Is one likely to be small when the other is small? We want to get this idea of correlation. The correlation becomes an important measure for us. Again, you can do this. This becomes very hard to work with and communicate to people. You can tell two people, hey, you know, this two wind farm is 50% correlated. That makes sense. You will not give them, I have a table for you. 
Go look at the table of how we got it. Okay. We want to get a correlation. We want to get an idea of how related things are. So correlation matters, right? Because we want to understand how they relate. And we'll make a very sort of technical definition. We'll make a very technical definition. What we'll look at as this so-called a linear relationship between two random variables. The correlation can come in many things. The word correlation does not have a very technical definition. How do we say whether they're related or not? So here we'll make a very technical definition. We'll look at the linear relationship between two random variables. This is the only thing we'll look at. This is the linear we'll look at. So again, the question you want to answer is you have Wx, W1. So if Wx is small, is Wy also small? So this is an important question we want to ask. So why is this an important question in process operation? You really, really care about this question if you're running the system. Why do you really care about asking this question? Right, so you worry about this again because you don't want everything to be small, right? You don't want all the generation to be low. So you're very happy if one is small, the other is large. At least they balance each other out. You're not very happy if this happens. And this, for example, is impacting, you know, Europe, right? So a few weeks ago, Europe was having energy crisis because wind power was small everywhere. There was no wind everywhere. So that you want to understand what is the likelihood of that happening, right? So again, often we care about the total, we care about the sum of these two. So do they cancel out or not? Do they move in the same direction? Do they move in the opposite direction? This is what we mean by cross correlation. This sort of linear measurement between the two. Right? So again, this you worry about this quite a bit when you're running scenarios. Okay. So when you're running scenarios, this, this is the question you care most about. They're both large, we can deal with it. The one is large, one is small, that's also okay. But what if they're both very low? What if both small? So we'll make a definition. Again, this is one way to me measure correlation. There is a billion other ones. This is a standard one. Okay, so this is called rho x y. This is called a cross correlation coefficient. So that's just a name. So how do you do this? How do you compute this? Well, the way you do it is you get, so you get two random variables, wx, wy. We compute the average for one, the average for the other one. Okay. So these computations are done completely on the individual random variable. You got this random variable, compute this average. You got this one, compute this average. Okay, so you got some values to this computation. And then in addition to the average, you'll compute sigma x and sigma y. Also completely, completely independent between the two variables. So it is just some numbers. And then next, what we do is we now compute this correlation coefficient. That has the following form. You normalize by the product of the standard deviations. Then you sum over okay. this is the calculation we do. So what is this measuring? This is the probability multiplied by how far x away is from this mean, multiplied how far y is away from this mean, normalized by this or product. Okay. okay. So there's so this is just a definition. There's there's good reason behind why this is a good definition. 
So when is this value likely to be large? Let's look at this. How large can this value, right? So when is this thing likely to be large? Right, there, this, is too, this is large if these two products have the same sum. Right? So, if th so this is Wx minus Wx average, W1 minus W Y average. If x, when x is large, y tends to be large, then this will tend to have the same sign. If this is, right, or if this is small and this is small at the same time, they will have the same sign. And this product, we sum it up, tends to be more positive. Okay, so when this is positive, this shows that these two are more correlated, right, more correlated. It doesn't mean that they move in the same direction. Are they both, are they both large or both small? When will this be negative? As they're moving opposite direction. Right? So if you have different signs every time, and then you add this up, we have a negative number, it means they're anti correlated They're moving opposite directions. This will be very close to zero if they have no relationship, and they just some random, you know, positive negative things, and they just cancel out when you do the sum. Okay? So this number tells us, gives us a single number to characterize how sort of uh, correlated things are. So this is a, there's a shorthand notation for this. If you write the expectation values, we'll use this shorthand because again, sometimes it's shorter to write this way. So this is a equivalent definition. So again, this, the reason this is useful is this turns out to be entirely, this is will between minus one and one. Right? So the smallest this thing can get is minus one, the largest thing can get is one. So if it's one, it means they're moving in entirely same direction. If it's minus one, they're moving off the direction. If it's zero, it's on point. It doesn't matter. So when we so when we for example to answer the question, are they both likely to be small at the same time? You look for if this is very close to one, they're both likely to be small at the same time or large at the same time. Are you worried about this? If this is very close to negative one, then you're happy because they're never small at the same time. <laughs> one is small, the other is large. So you know the average, the sum between the two is sort of very uh it's a very constant number, it's from a constant. Okay. Zero just means that uh, you know one doesn't care about that. So there are some chance of being like this. So this is a very good number to look at. It's a good number because again, it's bounded. The sign makes sense. That covers extreme conditions. Okay, so in engineering, this is we like this sort of number. There's a single number that characterizes complicated phenomena. Everything is interpretable. Okay, okay. so this is why this is used all the time. Go ahead. Yes. Oh, yes. So one big application will be, right? So when you plot this thing for one, this is not very good. When you have two one sides, this is normally pretty close to one, or at least positive. The good thing about solar is solar in general is anti correlated with one. So that's why people talk about common, you know, winter and solar being complementary to each other. When one is large, one is small. Technically, as you compute this number, it's negative. Solar on one tends to be very negatively correlated. Right, so for for some places, not for everywhere, but for a lot of places, especially for a large region, when that's our tends to be negatively correlated. And the, the, the reason we can conclude they're negatively correlated is by computing this. Actually, if you look at all those things, so you just take a bunch of data and just compute this number, and you get something out of it. You get uh, something else. Okay. Okay, any other questions? So this is a very useful number. We compute this number all the time. Okay, anytime you get a bunch of data for a bunch of one size, you go and compute this number. This relates two of them. There's ways to relate three and four and so on. This that, that will be too much for this class. We need too much notation to describe things like that. And the big challenge again in probability and statistics, especially applied to renewables, is how do you do this calculation? We have a bunch of them. Far. I have like 10 of them. How do I describe the correlation between all 10 of these things? Right. There, you can, you know, again, it becomes how do you communicate that to people? How do you communicate that to the policymakers? 
at least this is something you this community. Okay, so that's why again why we like this number. Shows up all the time, you need to understand. Yeah, you can apply this to anything, right? Between any two random variables, this is defined. This, this is always defined, or always be to this number. So that's, again, this is a good equation. This is a good number. Good metric, good metric to look at. So we'll do some examples. We'll do some examples, right? So let's see. So let's say now I'll give you two wind farms. I took fire measurements. And this is uh, the pair of measurements I've made, right? So every, every minute I've made, uh, I observe all these numbers. Okay. I observe all these. And let's find the uh, cross correlation. Okay, let's find the cross correlation between these two, between these two farms. Okay. So yeah, this is made of these numbers, <laughs> right? So that's a good example. So to find cross correlation, First, you need to find the average and the standard deviation for each. Then you use that sum. Okay. So let's find the average. That'll be one average. So for one farm one, again, this is just by itself, so you can ignore this column. Just average this out this column. Okay. Average this out. So this is one over five. I have five numbers, five plus zero plus one plus six plus ten. 4.4 meters per second. Similarly, you just average the second column for W2. 1 over 5, 1 plus 3 plus 0.5 plus 6 plus 8. This is 3.7. So this is for each. Now let's compute the standard deviation. So again, this is done at each of the individual columns for each individual farm. And so this is a summation minus average squared. So for the first farm, this is five minus 4.4 .4 squared plus zero minus 4.4 .4 squared plus one minus the squared plus This is, and the sigma one is just the square root of this. You get four point oh four meters per second. Okay, so again, entirely restricted to the first column. Right? When we do this, this is all about each individual columns. Yeah, we haven't done the cross correlation yet. We need to do some work to do the cross correlation. Similarly, so similarly, you can do sigma two. I won't show the equations. I won't write out all the equations. Uh, this is the three meters per second. So now let's do the cross correlation. Right? Now let's do the cross correlation. So there's cross correlation between, let's say, x and y. Or between one and two, I guess. In this case, this is one over sigma one, sigma two. Okay. This is the now it's times the probability. So the probability for each of them is equally likely. So one one over five. Now we have a bunch of sum. This is the first number. Right? So this is the first pair. Right, so this pair comes, this 5 minus 4.4, .4, 1 minus 3.7, comes from the fact that this number is 5. The subtract is me. Why is subtract is mean multiply this together. And so the important thing is you cannot shuffle the order. Okay, the order matters. You cannot shuffle the order. So if they're lined up this way, this two has to go together. Right? Each row has to go together. So a common mistake people make is, especially for large data, and they tend to shuffle this. Uh, people somehow will sort one of these things. Do not do that. <laughs> so in your last class, somebody sorted the column. That, that's not the point. Right? The point is 
those are the data given to you, and the rows go together with computer cross correlation. Okay. Right. So for example, again in the final, you may see that you may be asked to do this by computer. Again, you can assume you can deal with large parallel data sets. Do not sort. Do not do anything to the order of all of these things. Okay. Do not uh, have order. So in the next one, you look at the next pair. This is zero minus four point four. 3 minus 3.7. Do all this for five of them, you get 0.77. Okay, so this will tell you this thing is fairly correct. Right? The two things are correct. Okay, so this is very close to one. So these two are fairly correct. Okay, so if you offer it, for example, a large system, you may be worried these two are too correct. Generally, you want this, you don't want this number to be too close to one. Okay. Questions for this example? Okay. Right, yeah, you get it. Yeah. So, all this, so, yeah, so let's actually think about this trade off. There's an interesting trade off here. So let's see. So in practice, right? So let's let's actually look at taking sides. And there's looking at taking sides, right? So we have multiple sites. Again, what we want, let's say we have W1, W2, these are different sites. I have uh, I have two sites, so I just say two sites. What we care about. This one power. Right? We care about the sum power. That's what we care about. We care about the total power. Okay? We care about the total power the two sides can generate. And then you want this to be relatively flat. So we care about this to be, so we want W at. This W, so the mean of W to be large, of course, more power I get, but the standard deviation to be small. Okay, so there's these two may not be in the same direction. Okay, you're not always guaranteed that you can make this large or make this small. Okay, you typically don't have this kind of guarantee. Right, and maybe you have two sides. Some sides you have a small sigma, but also a small mean. Sometimes you have a large mean, but also a small sigma. So the way this is typically done is to do something, draw something called a parallel front. But what this, what normally you do is you look at this kind of curve. So let's say you want an axis, you look at the mean. Another axis, you look at the standard deviation, right? So the best point on this kind of plot is let's say something here. Very large mean, very small standard deviation for the sum. Okay, for the sum of it. You want a large mean, small standard deviation, so you want to be pointed here. You may not be able to achieve this point. Okay, there may not be a point that's here that's dominate everything. Okay, so normally you have a trade-off where as the mean gets larger and larger, this thing may get larger and larger. And so normally you have this kind of trade-off, but often what this curve looks like is something like this. Okay, this may be this may be what the curve looks like. As as mean gets larger, the standard deviation also gets larger. There may be more correlates. There may be reinforcing each other. Right? Maybe if there's you know one location that's very good for one speed. You want to build everything at one location. Okay, so you have this kind of curve. So this is called a parallel front. That means every point, no point here dominate other points. <laughs> There's nothing that dominates other points here. You, your solution will be lying on this front. Right? So what, right, for example, this is a, so we won't choose this point. The reason you would not choose anything here is this is a bad point. I can find you another point 
with a smaller, for example, smaller standard deviation or a larger mean. Okay, so this is a bad point. You will notch, this is not an optimal point in either sense. Whereas points on this front may be optimal. Okay, they're not dominant by any other point. Right? So this point has very large standard deviation, but also very large mean. You may prefer this point, or you may prefer a point like this. Or a mean small standard deviation is optimal. So normally when you do side choices, as you want to draw this kind of turtle front with all kinds of different trade-offs and pick a some point on the front. You may have some optimization objective you want to achieve and be selecting some selection on the front. So, so this is called sort of, you know, anything above this is called achievable region. Uh, you can achieve these. You cannot achieve anything here. You cannot achieve anything here. So this is the trade-off you have. Well, a lot of research and a lot of this sort of planning goes into drawing this kind of curve. Okay. So this parallel front has an important curve that people look at all the time. Understand what kind of trade-offs do we have? What's achievable, what's not? And let's take a point on this curve. Okay. So, so a lot of times people want to argue, you know, what can I do? You know, I want something here. I just, you don't have this kind of thing. Okay, all you, what you can do is limit it on this curve. And then you gotta pick from this curve. Okay, so this is the important engineering aspect of the problem. Okay, you may very well want something here. You just don't have it. Okay, so that's the kind of communication to convince people that, the, so I have this conversation with people before is people always want something. They all want the best of you know, both worlds. They all want something with no downside. You have to convince them this is the best you can do. And a lot of research, for example, my research is categorizing what is the best you can do. So my job typically, research, is not telling you which point you should pick on this line. That, that's not my job. My job is to draw this line. So quite a bit of my research is for characterizing this kind of front. And where can you offer me? And you know, it's up to other people to pick wherever they want to offer on this kind of curve. You, they have to look at the trade-off. This kind of curve is typically hard to draw for a practical system. Because in a practical system, it's not this stuff. You have a transmission line construct. Your transmission line makes this not a sign. You have to look at how much power can transfer between the lines. You have voltage constraints. You have stability constraints. You have all this constraint. But this becomes complicated. So the general just is the same thing. So you have this kind of curve that you want. Any questions about this five slide? Okay, so yeah, so the goal is to get here. So the cross correlation will tell you, give you something about how this curve is shifted. Okay, so the things are negative correlated, you can probably get to here. The things are very positive correlated, this curve will shift it way up this way. Okay. So that's the idea we have. Again, so to finish, let's look at solar. Okay, so solar, and we'll go into solar a bit more next class, I guess. So they typically have a negative, they typically have very negative row, negative cross correlation. Why is that? There's, I mean, this, is, this is sort of very intuitive. Is it because one tends to be blow at night, sort of to not have, right? So you have this sort of very clear day night cycle between solar and wind. So again, it's, it's, and the geographically also the same thing. Here, wind is pretty good, solar is not very good. So in California, solar is very good, wind not so much. You have this sort of natural ne negative correlation between the two. So there's something you can exploit. What's the problem of, or what's the challenge of using this negative correlation between the two? There is a challenge actually between. You would think, okay, let's just add these two and we'll be done, we'll have a fairly firm generation. That typically doesn't happen by itself. So what's the challenge of using this? Right, there are, and, right, so one is they're dissimilar, they tend to be opposite. But there's still a chance they're both small. Right? So it doesn't solve everything for a chance, but there are also some other chance. Right? Uh, 
Uh, you can build pretty large for solar as well. So the magnitude is not a huge issue from a grid perspective. So the challenge for this is they're native for it, but they almost never at the same location or, or time. So there is a space or time separation here. Okay, so one that is negative correlation doesn't solve everything. There is still a chance. It could happen, right? not zero chance. But also, this is a never as the or rarely, I guess not never. The same space time. So this is not. Uh, this just means that if you look at one location at one time, you either have one or you either have. It's not both at the same time. What you want is both to be on the same time. If one gets larger, one gets smaller. That's what you want. So that's not, you either at night, we have a lot of wind, no solar, or in the mid afternoon, on a calm day, a lot of solar, no wind. Okay. And you know, for us, we'll never have very good solar. Very rare we have very good solar. Even during summer, our solar is not very that good. We have good wind. Then California has not very much wind, but very good solar. So how do you solve this problem? How do you do this sort of space time averages? So one is you need to build a lot of transmission lines. You can average over space, right? So that's, you know, link us to California, we can average. So one is that, uh, so for space or spatial dimension, I guess for the more transmission lines, We need to transfer power between different locations. No help averaging. Okay. How about time? How about time? How, how do you deal with the time dimension? Okay. Storage, right? So this is storage. This is storage. And this does not mean just battery storage. Yeah, this can come in many forms. For example, so what's the biggest form of storage for us here? Hydro, right? We have our storage capacity is very, very large because of hydro. Okay, so this could be batteries, but hydro is more likely today actually to have hydro. So one good example of this averaging is actually what's happening right now. Okay, so have folks heard of the balancing market, the Northwest, right? So balancing market is a, so one good example is the, so this is the West Coast. So this links basically, this links Washington state down to Oregon, down to California. Now this is the balancing market we have. What this allows us to do is we using this existing for transmission line we have, Washington State and Oregon will try to balance out the power in balance within California. Okay. So spatially, this is done by transmission line. Temporally is we have a lot of hydro storage. Our hydro can absorb a lot of uncertainties in California. Okay. So this is our balancing marker. This is used by hydro. Okay. And uh, the, the way you make money is you damp out the variation in California. So they need energy, they can borrow from hydro. If they have excess energy, we can send it to hydro, right? we can schedule hydro. This is where a lot of, so if, uh, at least a lot of current, what our current utilities are working on. So our current, our utility faces two challenges. One is, you know, again, integration of renewables, all that, that's common. We have a unique challenge of how do you squeeze money out of hydro. Okay, we have by far the largest hydro infrastructure in the U.S., uh, not quite as large as Hydro Quebec, that's the largest in the U.S. And this is, they're trying to squeeze money out of California by utilizing hydro. Okay, and this is providing some extra source of income. So if you go to work for example, Tacoma, Power and Light, a lot of their focus is looking back at hydro. 
Haito is a good form of storage. It's a very large form of storage. It helps you to, California is trying to go to sort of auto renewable. It by itself does not have enough storage or does not have even nearly enough storage. The idea is to do this for spatial temporal average. Right? Spatial, you link with other, other states or other areas and the storage can happen you know, either in California or other, other areas. So we have done the easy part. This is the easy part is because we already have transmission lines and we have hiding, right? So if the harder part is what happens if you don't have transmission lines or you don't have enough capacity and you cannot tap into hydro. Okay, so if you have hydro and have transmission, actually technically we won't say much more about this here. This sort of engineering challenging or politically challenging, but otherwise straightforward. So next class, we'll look at what happens if you have remove, turn this hydro to a battery, and then what happens, right? How does battery operate? We'll look at some, uh, we'll look at some equations for battery. We'll go beyond these black box model, not quite to the chemical, sort of the chemistry model, but we'll give some intermediate model in batteries. Then we'll introduce a market of how does a battery make money in a market, which is a lot harder than you would imagine. Again, this is easy to make money out of. Battery, not so much. Okay. So we'll see the difference between hydro and storage for that. Okay, so we'll do that next class, starting from next class. And again, reminder, sort of homework is out and do you next one. Okay, thanks.